Um, so this is going to be a plenary session on a convergence curriculum provided, uh, powered by iGUIDE platform. So we will, we will have Eric Shook, who is a professor in uh, geography department in the University of Minnesota, who's going to, to be the lead presenter, as well as we'll have Carol Song and Rajesh from Purdue, who will be presenting our iGUIDE platform and the progress we have made there. Um, so without further ado, maybe Eric. So welcome everyone, my name is Eric Shook. Um, I am the co-lead for education and workforce development here at iGUIDE. So while I'm talking about the convergence curriculum, it's really uh, the fine work of many, many people. Uh, and today we're gonna be talking about how the convergence curriculum is really powered by the iGUIDE platform and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Two big ideas that I wanted to focus on in this talk is uh, around the convergence curriculum and how it interacts with the iGUIDE platform. One is that it supports convergence learning. So that means that we're supporting what we call multiple learner pathways, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means in just a second. And importantly, that it's useful for multiple communities of practice. Uh, so this is not a curriculum for one field, and that adds a lot of complications and chaos, uh, mostly for us as we're doing the design and implementation in trying to make sure that the curriculum materials fit the needs of multiple different communities, um, and the number of communities continues to expand. The second big idea that I want to focus on is how we're trying to build it in being open and accessible. We're actually building it out in the open, so you are seeing the materials as we're developing them. Um, rather than doing a build it all, have it all refined, and then release it upon the world, we've been very meticulous in gathering feedback along each step of the way so that we can iteratively refine, make improvements, make sure that what we're building on makes sense for the communities of practice. Uh, before we continue on with the next step. We're also leveraging what are called open educational resources, so the resources that are already out there. There's a lot of great material out there and there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. So we're leveraging those resources as much as possible and then mostly spending our time filling in gaps uh, where things have either uh, don't fit all of the needs uh, for everyone or are entirely missing. And all of this is really just to lower barriers to access. Make it easier for instructors to be able to take the material, make it easier for learners to be, up, be able to actually learn and apply the materials. So those are our kind of big ideas behind the curriculum. So in terms of learning pathways, we can go through a lot of long academic definitions. Uh, I'm a visual learner, so I like drawing pretty pictures. Uh, a really easy way to understand learner pathways is the experience of the individual. All of us have our own unique learner pathway of how you got to here, and you continue to learn throughout your life, so you'll have a unique pathway going forward. Uh, and, you know, we can have some fairly traditional pathways, which is kind of straight and narrow. You start as a hydrologist, you end as a hydrologist, right? Uh, you might deviate ever so slightly. Maybe you start off as an atmospheric scientist, you migrate over to hydrology. There's no big, you know, jumps in that platform. Uh, we all have a family or a friend who took the more meandering path, right? Philosophy major over here into biology, jumped over to chemistry, now we're in atmospheric sciences and then we're coming back again. So um, what we have to appreciate is that everybody's coming from a unique background and what our goal is with the convergence curriculum is not to get them into uh, expertise across all of the fields, but to bring all of the people with their various backgrounds and learning pathways to converge at a certain time for a certain problem. Right, So this isn't trying to build a degree program. Um, this is really trying to say, how do we train the GI scientists, the social scientists, and the hydrologists to be able to work on the social impacts of aging dam infrastructure, right? What is the training and the education that needs to happen in order to get those people to converge, talk to each other, and actually solve the problem? Once they've worked on the problem, they've solved it, then they might take their pathways and distribute out. So this is kind of what we're shooting for. Um, 
And if we're comparing against uh, kind of traditional educational models, something that everyone's familiar with, even if you haven't heard the term, is called the T model. Uh, this is how universities are built. You have, you have liberal education, right? Creating a breadth of knowledge, right? These are all your general education uh, credits. And then you have a, a disciplinary degree. This is where you build knowledge depth in one area, right? For those of us who go into computational science, data science, then we introduce what's called the Pi model, where you actually have two legs of knowledge depth, right? You have maybe a domain discipline and then you know, some computational science or data science. Uh, the problem with both of these models is that your knowledge depth still sits in isolation. So what we're really trying to build is tentatively what's called the U model, where what we want to do is actually take your knowledge and actually connect it at a, in a deep way, right? And this is what we're talking about in terms of convergence, either within your own mind as a single person or within the collective group if we're doing collaborative problem solving. How do we do that? Uh, we have version 1.0, the convergence curriculum. If you've seen this picture, it has been evolving because we've hosted multiple listening sessions um, trying to refine it based off, of, uh, based off of feedback that we receive. The whole idea is at the very bottom of this curriculum framework, we have what's called foundational knowledge threads. We uh, kind of propose that each of these foundational knowledge threads have their own way of thinking, they have their own ways of working with data. They have their own methods. They have their own ways of, of operating with tools uh, that sit in isolation with all the other ones. So you can learn ethics without ever understanding computing, for example, right? Um, and it's these five foundational knowledge threads that are really crucial to build up convergence learning for um, geospatial data science. Once you have the foundational knowledge, then we can start building in knowledge connections. And this is where we're actually starting to connect two or more of those foundational knowledge threads, right? We're drawing in geospatial with ethics to get into the subdomain of geoethics, okay? Once we go one step further, then we get into what we call knowledge frame, where we're incorporating advanced and cutting edge technologies that really frame our understanding and our knowledge. So there are going to be certain questions, certain problems that we will tackle within these knowledge frames that you wouldn't tackle uh, without those cutting edge technologies. So this is kind of scoping what it is that we're talking about. You're not gonna tackle certain philosophical issues uh, when you're using AI models, right? Um, but importantly, knowledge frames is how we start to bring in the knowledge connections and very importantly, the domain knowledge components into GeoAI and then the slightly broader geospatial data science. Once you've kind of framed your problem and you've started to build up your, your knowledge frame, that's when we can actually get to knowledge convergence, where you're really bringing in the domain knowledge, the geospatial data science, and trying to tackle those bigger problems that we've been hearing about all this morning and we'll hear about more this afternoon. Um, so the idea is, is that different learners will experience this curriculum differently. So if you're a GI scientist, you already have foundational knowledge in geospatial and analytics. You don't need to build that. Um, but you might need a little bit more knowledge in computing or ethics, let's say. If you're a social scientist, maybe you're really strong in ethics and analytics, but you need to learn a little bit more about visualization. So each person will experience it differently. And then they might experience it or need it at different depths. So the other aspect of the curriculum model is that we have a very modular structure. So at each, for each one of these components, let's say geoethics or geovisualization, we have um, different levels that you can actually interact with those components. So in 30 seconds, you can read three sentences and then we all have a common definition of what we mean when we say geovisualization. Uh, going one step deeper, we have three slides. So in about three minutes, an instructor or a learner can get a really high level understanding of what it is that we're talking about with that component. Uh, so those three slides consist of a definition, what are we talking about, uh, an example, and some sort of an active learning kind of question, discussion prompt, or something like that. So this makes it really easy for instructors to be able to drop these three slides into an existing slide deck, especially with the feedback that we get that everyone's curriculum's full, right? No one wants yet another class. They don't have anybody to teach it. They don't have room in their degree programs. So this gives us different ways of people being able to bring in these topics, depending on the level of knowledge that the learner wants to gain. 
Uh, so those are already done, and now what we're currently working on are three-hour modules. So here we're going to have about a one-hour lecture, a one-hour hands-on activity, and an hour's worth of kind of reading or reflection exercises so that learners can kind of come prepared uh, for the lecture and the hands-on activity. And it's the hands-on activity that brings us closer to the iGUIDE platform because many, uh, if not uh, most of our hands-on activities actually use the iGUIDE platform or will be using the iGUIDE platform as they're being developed uh, so that instructors don't have to build their own infrastructure. So it makes it very easy for an instructor to be able to adopt the curriculum because you just need the slide deck that we have notes for and then you just point the students to the platform um, so you actually don't have to support all of, the, all of the stuff that we've been talking about over the past couple of days here. Um, so this is kind of the idea with supporting convergence learning, uh, is that we have a flexible framework uh, that people can explore differently at different knowledge depths, and we're kind of working on building that. Um, and we're building it out in the open, so anybody can go to this website, I'm not gonna read off the URL because it's really long, um, you will see the image of the, I didn't test this, so this is, this is a risky click here. Uh, <laughs> um, you can see the, the model that I just presented, and then you can come down here and you can see the, the materials as we've been developing them. So if you want the three sentences on ethics, there it is. If you want the three slides on ethics, there it is. Um, so the three-hour module is still in development. We're close to releasing that. Um, but uh, once we have it ready to go and reviewed, then it will be online. So as materials are coming up, we're opening them up and sharing them with everyone so that we can get feedback. Um, so as we're doing this, um, we are really trying to, you've heard it, me say it several times, but try to gather feedback so that we're actually building something that's useful. Um, so this has taken us a little bit longer than we were hoping, but what we're doing is really trying to rule out something that, that's helpful. Uh, case in point, uh, I was just at the AI for Good Global Summit uh, a couple of months ago, and now one of our um, kind of stakeholder groups is gonna be ITU, so now I'm joining some committees in order to get um, our curriculum and pieces of our curriculum, especially focused on GeoAI, uh, out there for ITU in the UN. So that's kind of one application of trying to actually build it, gather the feedback as we're going. Um, and that was a little bit made possible because we had some of the materials already ready to go. Um, the other exciting aspect of it is that um, we, are, we are doing it now live. Um, students in my advanced geocomputing class uh, technically met this morning when I was here. Um, and they're actually testing the GeoAI components uh, as we speak. Um, and it's really thanks to uh, Rajesh and the iGUIDE platform, I want to give a huge shout out to him, um, making sure that the platform components support this cool work. Um, I also want to give a shout out to one of the teams at the iGUIDE Summer School that was co-led by me and Diana Sinton. Um, one week before the summer school started, IBM and NASA released what they call a GeoAI Foundation model. Um, we pivoted our team in that week to say, let's test it and let's fine tune our own model using it. So in one week's time, uh, these participants learned enough about GeoAI, um, learned enough about foundation models, learned enough about fine tuning in order for them to actually create their own fine tuned model off of a foundation model that was released literally the week before. Um, we're trying to roll that out in my classroom right now. Uh, I hit some speed bumps literally Tuesday before I flew out of here. Um, so I'm refining those materials and those materials will be available um, from the curriculum components pretty soon. One of the experiences that I commented to both groups is that I think that this is really revolutionary in the way that we teach. Um, the way that I was teaching um, this geocomputing class last year is building up an AI model from scratch, which is a great learning exercise. The issue is that you, um, you don't get very far. Uh, the accuracy stays low, it ends up being kind of a toy model. With this, 
because you're building off of a foundation model, you get something that's fairly accurate right away, and then you can build from there, and it's something that they're really excited about because it's an IBM and NASA uh, foundation model, so they connect straight to the cutting edge. So I think that this is, this is a huge step forward uh, in terms of teaching and learning, and it'd be really impractical without the iGUIDE platform being able to enable it. Um, which brings me to uh, one of the benefits of the curriculum. It's uh, something that I like to call batteries included. So it's not that we just give you, you know, here's your slides, here's a couple of notebooks. Just stand up a Jupyter Hub, make sure that it's well resourced, make sure that it has the entire geospatial software stack, you know, make sure it's available and everything else. It's, uh, here's a link to some materials that are all hosted by iGUIDE. So it makes it really, really easy for uh, the community to adopt, and as things come up, such as IBM and NASA releasing a, a model, uh, we can stand it up within a week and actually have people using it, which would be a really big ask for instructors. Um, so to learn a little bit more, I want to pass it to Rajesh, who can, who can actually show and go into a little bit more depth. All right. Well, thanks, Eric. Uh, hi, I'm Rajesh Kalyanam. I'm a research scientist at Purdue University and uh, representing the core CI team here. Of course, this is work done by several people on the CI team. I'm just the, uh, the person uh, showing things off. <laughs> so, uh, so here is just sort of trying to recap uh, what Eric was just saying about convergence learning, but maybe a different view of this. So, uh, all the things that are on the platform are really a combination of these three big pieces, so GIS, domain science, and cyber infrastructure. So if you get a chance to go to that platform page and see some of the, the notebooks and learning materials out there uh, that you can use, then it's, it's really um, uh, essentially the cyber infrastructure that's sort of behind the scenes, and Shawan kind of alluded to this uh, earlier this morning with like all the hidden steps uh, behind uh, a workflow that's running on the platform. Uh, but then uh, to actually make this interactive and useful for people who are um, looking at these workflows and running these um, scientific um, codes. You have to have a GIS component as well, which I'm sure we all appreciate uh, that uh, it can help with uh, both visualization, spatial analytics, and all of that. And then uh, since this is iGUIDE and the, the big focus is on convergence science, so of course there's a lot of domain science uh, involved from multiple different disciplines. And, and most of the examples you'll see there on the platform are all uh, not just one discipline, but different disciplines coming together to solve an actual science problem. Um, so, um, again, one last slide, hopefully, before the demo. Um, so, uh, the other aspect that Eric talked about was open and accessible. So, these are some of the features of the platform that, that really make this possible. Uh, I'm sure we all realize it's, it's web accessible, it's open to anyone who wants to come in and start using it. Uh, I'm sure some of you who used it yesterday in the, in the tutorial saw that um, it uses federated authentication, so you don't have to have your own account on the platform if you have an institutional credential, or even just a Google account, you can log in and use it. Um, and then all the other pieces, I won't really get into that, but it supports um, workflows, community contribution, and really I think the hope is that as we roll this out, like Eric mentioned, uh, with open development, we hope that people will contribute materials to it, uh, put their workflows and codes up on the platform, and we can certainly help uh, with all of that. So, uh, I took this picture yesterday. This was one of the, the tutorials I was using uh, the platform for uh, just an educational experience on how to download uh, DEM data and process it. And I know one of our speakers this morning also said he was uh, really interested in, in using that handout. Uh, so, uh, so we did a toy problem first, which is that small thing in orange that you see there, uh, which is a Cedar Creek watershed. So we, we tried to get the, the elevation data for that. Uh, but then Venkatesh, uh, who you can see there in the picture, wanted to go big or go home, as he said. So then we, we figured we, what the hell, we'll, uh, we'll probably do it for the whole Ohio River Basin. Uh, of course, uh, I don't know how well it worked out in the end, but I think we did get the, the workflow to actually run and give you results. And so those maps right there are actually uh, the, the shape file of the watershed that's returned when you run this workflow. And you can see the one in gray is the Ohio River Basin, um, which has a really small point up there, which is, which is the actual toy example. Uh, but then we did the other one live as well yesterday. So, so that was great to, to see in practice. Um, I won't get into too much of the technology. I'll just point out a few things here. So uh, the scale is really uh, sort of supported through these different pieces uh, from the cyber infrastructure world. The first thing is a big uh, supercomputer that's at Purdue called Anvil, which is funded by the NSF. Uh, it provides nearly a million or a billion core hours per year, so we can really use that to, to do the more resource-intensive 
computations. There's a few other things uh, which help with both uh, portability, reproducibility, and large-scale data transfers. Um, the other big piece is convergence. So this is where the domain scientist and the cyber infrastructure people come together. So um, we build these codes to be reproducible, uh, and these workflows to be able to be hosted on the platform. But really, what sort of well, what's the glue that 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 takes the scientific code, makes it possible to run this on the HPC environment, so you're not really running it on your laptop, is uh, CyberGIS Compute, and then the other big piece, which is GeoEDF, uh, which helps get data, uh, process it, and and this was again used in the tutorial yesterday to, to bring the, the watershed uh, DEMs, uh, rasters from USGS and Amazon Web Services, and then do all of the processing, the merging, reprojecting, and all of that. And then finally, uh, this is sort of what the, the users and the researchers see. So you have the two big pieces on the, on the platform. Eric kind of showed you uh, the page, uh, the screenshot of that. So you can either come in through Jupyter Hub, which is sort of the core interactive computing platform where you do all these workflows, and really we, we focused on Jupyter just because it's, it's really familiar to a lot of researchers now. Uh, most of these codes run with like R or Python. Uh, anything that needs to use more sort of C++ or Fortran and run on HPC systems, we can do that through CyberGIS Compute, which is the glue that, that connects the platform to uh, the HPC environment. And then the resource catalog, which is, um, as Shawan mentioned, still in the beta stage, uh, It'll have sort of this, this growing catalog of all the resources uh, that researchers can use and which are hosted on the platform. So this can be anything from, say, uh, Jupyter Notebooks that help you reproduce some analysis, uh, software codes that you can use in your own workflows, um, and then um, other resources uh, that you might be able to use in your training and education, like Eric mentioned. So, so once we have the curriculum hosted, uh, that will also be cross-listed in the catalog. So, uh, and then this all comes together. Uh, here's the sort of layered diagram of all, the, all these pieces fit together. So I'll switch really quick to this one workflow which you've seen Shawan mention earlier this morning. I just wanna show you a live demo of that, um, hopefully skipping a few steps uh, and how it runs on the platform. So really the, um, the intent here is to do this analysis of the impact of the aging dams infrastructure in the US on socially vulnerable populations. Uh, so if it's a single dam, um, you can do it on your laptop. Uh, if it's a bunch of different dams, and that's where you saw this morning that it's not just one dam, but it's the combined effect of multiple dams around the country. Uh, but then if you scale it to the 350 dams in the US for which you actually have uh, flood inundation data, because the primary analysis here is uh, if this dam uh, floods, then what's the impact on downstream populations uh, who may already be vulnerable to, to other factors as well. Uh, so when you go to that scale, uh, then that's not really something you can do on your laptop, and that's where the platform sort of comes into play. Um, and uh, in this case, I'll just do a really quick demo of the platform and this particular notebook that, that helps you reproduce this analysis. So if you're interested, you can go back um, and run it yourself and then see that it, that it actually works, and then maybe change a few things um, and then see how, how that works as well. So. Switching here, so this is the, um, the URL that you've probably seen this morning, so it's iguide.illinois.edu slash platform. Once you come in here, there's, there's the two big um, entry points that I just talked about, the, the catalog or the resource catalog, which is the one below, and then uh, the one above here is, um, is what takes you to the Jupyter Hub for running these uh, workflows. So clicking on that there, um, you can see there's a few different notebooks here which you can uh, launch directly on the platform. And uh, a couple of these are uh, examples from our summer school, so I think you'll have a talk about that uh, later this afternoon, uh, so you can sort of uh, follow along with their analysis as well later on. Uh, but then down here is this notebook that I'm just gonna be showing now, which is uh, what's the impact of dam failures on, on populations in the US. So uh, when you click Open Notebook, it essentially re redirects you to this um, landing page for the, for the Jupyter Hub. And then you can sign in um, with CI Logon, which is this federated authentication mechanism. And there's a bunch of different organizations, as you can see, but I'm just gonna choose Purdue here. Click Logon, and at this point, it's um, essentially launching uh, my own sort of Jupyter workspace in the cloud. Um, and uh, I don't think it really showed that, but if you're doing this for the first time, uh, it's also gonna pull in the notebook from a GitHub repository uh, where it's uh, being managed and maintained and then drop you into that notebook as we saw here. So 
uh, it's pulling all the, the notebook and its associated data sets and everything else, and then um, drops you in the notebook, and then you can just follow along with the analysis at that point. So obviously, I'm not going to run through this, um, this whole notebook. It'll take a while, but I just want to show you a few pieces here. So most of this is, I'm, I'm guessing, pretty familiar to most of you. But uh, where the, the platform sort of comes um, into play is in making it easy to do more of the resource intensive things just directly from the notebook itself. So this, again, pretty familiar, just importing a bunch of libraries to, to do your visualization. Uh, we'll ignore the warnings. But then uh, the first step here is, uh, let's say you want to do this analysis for one DAM. Um, oh, before I go on, I should say, uh, I'm just the guy demoing this, but this is actually analysis that was done by a geographer uh, who's part of iGUIDE, Dr. Jin Wu Park, and then a few other people. Uh, and then this, this notebook really is sort of intended to be, uh, uh, to, to sort of um, go along with the paper that's, that's being reviewed currently. So, so anyone who's, uh, who's gonna be reading the paper in the future will be able to then reproduce this analysis as well. But, um, so, so the analysis uh, for a single dam, essentially what it does is uh, it figures out the flood inundation map for that dam, which is uh, published by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, that's just a raster map, and then it sort of discretizes that, um, turns it into a bunch of different flood inundation levels, and then does a spatial autocorrelation analysis with the inundation depth, uh, these inundation levels, and then the different social and vulnerability indicators um, that you have. So the 16 different variables, like say, uh, no high school diploma, no population, maybe below 150% of the, or yeah, 150% of the poverty level, things like that. And then tries to figure out what's the, what's the correlation between, uh, say, inundation risk and then these at-risk populations. Um, so since this is resource intensive, you could do this for one dam, maybe on your laptop, but then maybe for the larger dams, for example, uh, the one that this shows, in California, you can't really do it um, on your laptop because it's uh, the inundation map is, say, three gigabytes uh, large, and um, you run into memory issues sometimes with that. So, uh, so this one is just showing you how you can run that specific analysis for one single dam uh, by submitting a job to the cluster at this particular point in the notebook, and that's where CyberGIS Compute comes into play. So uh, once the cell executes, you'll see an interactive interface for submitting a bunch of different um, jobs, one of which is this particular job that's been configured to do this analysis for a dam. Uh, and if you go to this drop-down list, you'll see there's a few other things that have been published here. This was all worked and was done by the iGUI team for a bunch of other workflows as well. Uh, and each of these are essentially job templates that can be submitted um, and then run on HPC. We'll choose this one here. I'm not gonna run the job, um, but I'll just show you a bunch of other features of this. So, uh, so you can also select your computing resource that you want to use for this, uh, and different jobs may run on different resources, depending on where the data sets have been staged for that particular job. Uh, you can also set your um, job parameters. Uh, so as I say, it's, this is resource intensive, you might wanna give it more memory or time. Um, and then here's the, the input parameter. So all you have to do in this case is specify the dam ID and then it's going to do this analysis for this dam. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to run this. Uh, but once you've run that, then you can sort of proceed to the next step where um, it does this analysis, gets back a bunch of GeoJSON files, and then you can plot that result. And that's where your geographer or GIS person is more familiar with that. So, so this sort of hides all the complexity and then uh, the, the actual computation is hidden behind the scenes, runs directly on the supercomputer, and then once you have the results back, then you can uh, sort of uh, visualize it. 